Hello and good morning. Welcome to Population Health in Challenging Times, Insights from Key Domains, a virtual workshop of the Roundtable on Population Health Improvement from the National Academies. We are so pleased to have you here today. If you have been joining us the last day or two, we have had a number of virtual workshops from key domains. Yesterday was academics and social sector. Those uh, comments will be up on the website in about two weeks. Today, healthcare that you are joining. And this afternoon, another virtual workshop on public health. And Wednesday, cross sector. And Thursday, philanthropy. So you will get a lot of insights this week on those key domains. My name is Sandy Magnan, and I am a senior fellow at Health Partners Institute and associated with the University of Minnesota, both in Minneapolis, Minnesota. So a little housekeeping before we get started, that if you're a tweeter, uh, your hashtag PopHealthRT, and you can submit questions, which I urge you to do beginning early, to on the website, if you scroll to the bottom of the page, you will find a place to submit your Q&A. So I am delighted uh, to be here today with specifically, this is National Voter Registration Day. So it's a good call out to remind everyone to get out the vote. It's a civic duty that all of us share, all of us. So please remember uh, that it's National Registration Day for voting. So to get on with our program and key insights, I am delighted to have this wonderful panel of practitioners in their own right in healthcare, coming from different domains and different aspects of healthcare to share with you today. And I'm gonna ask them to introduce themselves. You can find their full bio on the website. So I'm gonna ask them to introduce themselves with who they are and where they're from and to share what they're doing during this turbulent time to stay grounded. So I'm gonna start with Vaughn, Vaughn Nguyen. Uh, thank you, Sonny. So my name is Vaughn Nguyen. I'm the Vice President of Clinical Operations in the Blue Cross plan in North Carolina. Um, and as you may know, North Carolina in our market, we're pushing pretty hard with all the partners, the providers, to really think about value-based care and how we might use value-based care, not just to treat people when they're sick, but how to really think about keeping them healthy and keeping our members and our patients and our citizens in North Carolina health healthy. You know, and the work we do is sort of all focused on that extent. And COVID has clearly thrown a monkey wrench um, in sort of all these plans, as well as uh, given us lots of opportunities. And one of those opportunities is to think much more uh, deliberately about how we might address uh, racial inequality and racial justice within this context of, of our, our, the work that we do. In terms of things that keep me sane, I have to say that um, homeschooling my kids is something I never thought I would do. And through this time, and it's been both a blessing and a curse, a blessing for me because I get to spend more time with my children, a curse for them, unfortunately, because I'm a terrible teacher. But it's all about me and I love having more time with my kids and it's just a wonderful opportunity to, um, to be a dad. Uh, and I really, really appreciate it. Dawn. Yes, hi, good morning everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to participate in this conversation. I'm Dawn Alley. I am Chief Strategy Officer at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. Uh, so our role is to test innovative payment and service delivery models to drive value, where we think of value as how much health we're getting per healthcare dollar we're spending. So really excited to talk about how that is changing this year in the context of uh, both the public health emergency and uh, tackling uh, racism and inequality in the healthcare system. Uh, in terms of what is helping me stay grounded, um, I would like to think that it would not take a global pandemic to uh, result in me teaching my five-year-old to bike uh, to pedal bike uh, without training wheels. Um, but that has been the great joy of the last few months. And we now have a routine where he bikes and I run behind him to try to keep up. So I'm also getting my steps in. Um, so that has been a, a really wonderful uh, literal grounding at times. <laughs> First done. Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Kirsten Bibbins Domingo. I'm a uh, I'm a general internist and I practice in our safety net setting at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital at San Francisco. 
Um, I'm the professor and chair of the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics, and I'm also the vice dean for population health and health equity in the UCSF School of Medicine. And in that context, also um, think with our Office of Population Health and Accountable Care in um, uh, UCSF Health. Um, I have uh, what I'm doing to stay grounded uh, during this uh, time, I, I live in a multi-generational household with my 25-year-old son, my husband, and my 84-year-old mother. And the new additions that keep me grounded are all of the plants. And I'm somebody who's never had a green thumb, but that's been the, the thing that has kept me grounded. All right, Phil. Phil. Hi, good morning, everybody. And thank you so much uh, for hosting this conversation and for asking me to be a part of it. Uh, my name is Philip Alberti. I'm the Senior Director for Health Equity Research and Policy at the Association of American Medical Colleges. Uh, for those of you that don't know the AAMC, it's a national not-for-profit membership organization representing 155 medical schools, about 400 or so teaching hospitals and health systems, uh, and we aim to lead and serve that community uh, to improve the health uh, of all. Of all. Um, I'm a social epidemiologist by training, and at the AAMC, I really focus on building partnerships, programs, and kind of the evidence base for solutions uh, to move our hospitals, our communities, and our nation towards health and healthcare equity. Um, I'm gonna take the same page of, of many of my colleagues. I have a four and a half year old son. Uh, I am grounded literally every day on the ground, uh, playing superheroes, playing pirates. We just bought the first big boy bike after the balance bike done. So I'm gonna come to you for bike riding training tips. Uh, we're excited to get started on that. Um, it really is a silver lining to be able to spend that much time with a uh, little man. So. Stella. Good morning, everyone. And um, I too am, uh, feel privileged to be a part of this panel. And thank you, uh, Sani, for the invitation. So um, I'm Stella Whitney West. I'm the CEO for North Point Health and Wellness Center in um, Minneapolis, Minnesota. And we are a federally qualified health center. We have been around for 52 years and we are a public entity community health center. What that means is that we are in partnership um, with Hennepin County. And uh, that partnership uh, includes that uh, we are also part of the county's uh, accountable care organization as well. So um, we do a lot of uh, uh, collaboration uh, with the different county departments, also with the different community organizations as well. Uh, and our mission is partnering to create a healthier community. So we are very much um, community focused, very much as all FQHCs, um, we practice outside of the clinical walls. We also have a nonprofit organization that provides a variety of different social services. So housing, employment um, are the two uh, main ones. Uh, what keeps me grounded, um, so I'm gonna go with kind of the theme, children, and, uh, but mine are uh, grandchildren. Uh, I have a granddaughter, that um, discovered the landline in her house. Everybody has a cell phone and she discovered the landline. So that has become her phone. And so she starts to call me. And so she made it a point to call, they call me Jima. She says, Jima, I'm gonna call you every day just to check on you, make sure you're okay. So it warms my heart. Um, and sometimes I only have a few minutes to talk with her, um, but she wants to make sure that Jima is okay. And so I promised her today that I would be coming over. Uh, she spent a weekend with a friend of hers. And so she wants to tell me all about the fun that she had. So, so I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you all for sharing. I'll, I'll share what keeps me grounded is a walk every morning, some time to uh, pray and meditate and literally put my feet on the ground to stay grounded there. So we're gonna spend some time uh, talking about, uh, you'll hear people say, well, when are we gonna get back to normal? Well, we're not getting back to normal. We're going to a new normal. What does the future look like? COVID-19 has disrupted everything, some good, some not so good. And 
the calls for racial and social justice in the light of things that have happened since George Floyd's death, tragic death. We have two things that are going on that are immensely powerful within healthcare, and we need to be paying attention to those as well as numerous other things that make it a very challenging time, such as the opioid uh, crisis that continues to accelerate in these times. But how do we think about and how do we see and hear the new things that need to be emerging? And that's what we're here to talk about today. What are the new systemic structural changes that need to occur to address racism? What are the new cultures that we need to be developing? What are the new policies and systems and partnerships with sectors outside our walls? I heard Stella say we practice outside our walls. How do we practice outside our walls and what does that look like? So my first question to you is, what are you seeing and hearing in any of those domains that are examples or stories of what the new normal needs to look like? And Phil, you're the first one on my screen here, so I'm just going to turn to you to uh, start us off. All right, excellent. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with a partnership story then, because when I think about what's really needed, you know, these are huge public health crises, racism, COVID, opiates, uh, and you know, health care is a social determinant, not the social determinant. And so these multi-sector partnerships are really crucial. So here's, here's one that I have found a lot of um, just excitement and I think telegraphing where we need to go as a sector. So every year the AAMC confers a, a, an outstanding community engagement award to one of its member institutions. Uh, this year, Rush College of Medicine and Medical Center uh, won for their work in Chicago. And so here's the, the example of a partnership. So for 30 years, uh, Rush College of Medicine has had um, a large service learning program for its learners, experiential learning, uh, three to four decades, dozens and dozens of community partners from public health to the shelter system, to faith-based organizations, to housing, to parks, et cetera. Uh, and so that's been ongoing for a very long time. Some of those partnerships have been more on the community outreach and input end of the spectrum. Some of them have been full-blown community-based participatory research. Uh, but here's, here's the story. So COVID hits, uh, and because of these partnerships, the students that were working in the shelter system said, hey, this congregate setting is going to get slammed from COVID. And we've seen that play out in Boston and New York and many, many cities and towns. Uh, and so because of this 30, 40 year history of deep connections to the community, Rush was able to pull together in real time, the right people from faith community, shelter community, housing advocates, public health, healthcare, not to lead the group, but to convene the group. Uh, and then that group in real time began to administer tests, address outbreaks, provide behavioral health services, look for gaps in continuity of care. And as of our virtual site visit to the finalists for this award just a month and a half ago, across the entire shelter system in Chicago, they had two COVID related deaths, two because of this incredible partnership. Now the story, you know, uh, one of the people from Rush said this partnership got more done in five months than in the 20 years prior. And that's really the story. It's that yes, COVID was a catalyst an accelerant, but without that substrate of long-term investments in partnerships, the activity, that five month activity that was so effective would never have come to pass. So I see this new normal as really kind of committed long-term bread breaking to build relationships in service of being able to be nimble and agile and face crises as they come. So that's what gets me optimistic about the new normal and maybe healthcare's place in a health ecosystem. All right, it, from any of our panelists, any questions for, for Philip about that story, about that example? It's really a powerful one, uh, Philip, thinking only two uh, deaths it would it could have been as you said they could have been slammed in a in a horrific way. Um, Vaughn, you shared something the other day when we were talking about your introspection at your own organization about how you needed to be different in this time. Could could you share some more about that or anything else that you want to share? Yeah, no, uh, no, Sonia. One of the interesting things here at, at Blue Cross is that it is both important and critical um, from a 
personal and business perspective for us to be involved with our community. We're not for profit plan, the largest one in North Carolina. And we see our role as both um, providing health insurance from a business aspect, but also being a responsible member of the community in which we serve. Um, and in that context, when the racial justice issue started to rise pretty dramatically within North Carolina as well as nationally, um, we felt it was important for us to take an internal look to understand where our opportunities were. It was sort of a fascinating conversation because we started out first thinking about, well, what should we do? I mean, there are all these calls for racial justice, there's protests in the street, and they're solving really big policy problems. Um, and, and we wanted to dive down into all of those and get involved in all of those um, as an organization. It was a recognition that, well, you know, we're, we're not necessarily the primary actor. There is, a, as Philip mentioned, it's this opportunity to think, how can we participate as part of a larger partnership? to think about a coalition of the willing, to really think about what our role within that coalition is, build the right partners to begin to address some of these big problems. And so in that context, we started to look inward and really understand what our role is within, um, within healthcare might be and within the insurance industry. You know, and, and then again, we began to take a, when we took a deeper dive, we actually began to look at the structural issues sort of associated with this to understand, well, what are some of the nuanced structural issues that, that only someone like me or someone who's really embedded in the industry could really recognize and begin to address? So one specific example of this, just as, a, as an example, is the idea of something called network adequacy, which is a requirement frequently for health plans to have doctors in every county or every zip code to make sure that we have appropriate coverage um, uh, for our insurance policies. You know, the network, um, the network um, adequacy requirements really just require one doctor in any given zip code or any, any given locality. And so you can imagine that, you know, I have one zip code in the inner city or one doctor in inner city, one doctor in a suburb, and then one doctor who might be in a rural community. But that doesn't necessarily affect the distribution of our patients or our members within those communities. There might be a rather large concentration of members who, who need access to a physician within urban centers, and one doctor doesn't cut it. The same applies for rural communities um, because of the geographic distribution. So one doctor in, in a given geographic area might be 20 miles away. And, and while you technically fit the definition of network adequacy, it's not really adequate. So really thinking hard about those structure issues and how we might go about to begin to take that next step and think about uh, the definitions that are sort of embedded in the work that we do and understanding how what we might address them to do our part to address, address uh, racial justice is critically important. And then using that as um, in partnership with other members of a coalition to sort of begin to build um, the solutions, much like Philip alluded to. First, then, what are you seeing and hearing? Or, or first, any questions for Vaughn about network adequacy? I think, Don, you... Uh, you alluded to a conversation that the two of you had had about a robust measure for uh, access. Previous well, I, I, yeah, I think, um, you know, this is a huge challenge at uh, CMS. We tend, I would say, on the whole to be better at uh, measuring issues related to cost and quality than those related to access. And we actually announced a large new rural health uh, opportunity a few weeks back, and we aim through that to increase access, but are grappling with how we actually measure that effectively. Um, I think the reason I sort of, I've joked about this previously is because I, as my general um, expectation from a CMS perch is that health plans are not going to be excited about uh, having those adequacy requirements increased or having more robust measurement of uh, access. Um, but I am really pleased to see the examples of plans that are uh, taking this on in a meaningful way and um, uh, and showing some leadership. So appreciate that from, from Vaughn and Blue Cross in North Carolina. All right, um, Kirsten. Yeah, one thing I appreciate about what Vaughn is saying is um, I think I think uh, there's so much that needs to be done, um, but uh, 
I think it's really incumbent upon all of our institutions to really think internally about what we are we are uniquely poised to do and what we should be doing. And ignoring that really doesn't align well with the values that we're trying to bring to bear. The partnership is critical, but also to be an authentic partner because you are really thinking through all the levers that you can do, use in your organization. And I sort of, um, I tend to be a glass half full type of person. So I'm, I'm optimistic at this time because I see so many parts of our organization thinking creatively in an innovative way. Um, but also, you know, I think there, there are also chal challenges. Um, and I think, um, I think the question, our sustainability is going to be, can we push beyond these challenges? So the example I like to give is that um, I'm, I'm really proud of a lot of the work of our institution in, um, in launching health equity councils at both of our hospitals of uh, understanding that we had to look um, internally at how we collect data, how we integrate um, equity principles um, into our standard ways we think in our organization, usually around quality and safety and patient experience, right? Um, and so, uh, and saying that to do that, we really have to make sure that we um, have uh, measures of race, ethnicity, language, sexual orientation, and gender identity really well coded, that we really have systems in the way our hospital usually holds units accountable uh, for our, our metrics. Um, to use these. And this has been a, an ongoing process for the last two years. And one that I became aware um, of in speaking in other parts of the country about, uh, despite the fact that unequal treatment uh, report came out of the National Academies, um, you know, almost two decades ago, um, that, that a lot of these issues are still, even the measurement issues are really not sort of universal. And so when the pandemic hit, it was actually our opportunity to say, well, we can actually monitor what's going on here. We can actually look to see whether we're testing in all areas of our of our of the patients that we serve, whether um, we can understand uh, uh, hospitalizations and deaths and things like that. So I think that's been good. And I think in other parts of the organization, which I can talk about later, we've really had these robust in the community partnerships that have been really working well with public health to really drive where we need to be. What we now need to do, I think, is have those two things come together. The healthcare is one of those things that, you know, it has a way of thinking and moving in a more sustainable way. It is one that has been really hard hit during this time, right? Economically, all of our healthcare institutions have, but how can we bring together what we are doing so well in the community and what we have laid the groundwork for on the healthcare side to really say, well, well, what, how do these two things align together in a sustainable way? And that's what I'm, uh, that has been a little bit more challenging, but it's, I'm optimistic that we have all of the pieces together to make this work. Can I ask a question that actually I think taps into what you just said, Kirsten, and also the network adequacy? I'm curious, is there any movement to really get patient and community perspective on what makes a network adequate? Right? You could have a hundred doctors in a community, but if the community members don't trust the doctors, don't know how to get there, don't want to go there, is that adequate? Is that network adequate? So how do you bring that together, the community perspective with this requirement that health plans and, and CMS might want to have? I'd really love Vaughn or, or Don to comment on, on this. I, I will say it is one of these ish thorny questions that we've been wrestling with as our own, as we've expanded our where we provide care. And so that that's it was very easy to think about it. Well, not easy, but it, we had a much a, a more contained footprint. And as we've gone out and and expanded out to partner with other um, providers of care, then the question is, well, well, what does that mean to think more about the community, right? So we're on the provider side, but um, but I'm curious on those who think more on the payer side. How, how they think of yeah, it. let me start and, uh, and I'll toss over to, to Don. Um, from our perspective, we're just getting started on this, just to be completely transparent, it's maybe a couple of weeks ago that we just identified this. Um, and, and I think what was interesting about this is this is a problem that's been staring us probably in the face for decades, <laughs> is my guess, with these network attitude requirements. But only now with sort of this uh, sort of confluence of everything coming together, are we beginning to look at it. Towards your point, Philip, I think your point is well taken and absolutely we should go out and do this and I'll bring this back to the team to do it. But we are literally just getting um, started with this. Um, there, there is, I would agree, um, sort of a numeric definition if you literally count um, the number of members or patients you have in the community versus the number of um, providers who might be on your plan and literally you could do the math that 
draw proportions and understand and measure network adequacy. But again, community-based definitions of what is technically adequate on, a, on paper will be very different from what your point. What is truly, what, what network adequacy means from the behavior of the members and the patients you're trying to serve. So very good point. Well, and I think from a CMS perspective, um, you know, we have certainly on the Medicare program side, a number of measures of patient experience that I think some of them get to some of these issues around trust and communication and availability uh, and timeliness of care. Um, but this is definitely a challenge, um, you know, particularly as we think about what value-based payment looks like in uh, Medicaid, you know, I think this is a generalization, but often in Medicare, to a certain extent, what we're talking about is people getting too much care or the wrong types of care, right? Mm -hmm. It's unnecessary testing, it's low value care, it's a lack of coordinated care or kind of multiple care coordinators. And that's a lot of what the focus is when we're talking about value-based care in Medicare. In many cases in Medicaid, the issue is people not getting care at all. <laughs> um, and there's other pockets where that's also true. Rural health is another area. And so, you know, as we think about what it means to provide value there, we have to think about how that looks uh, different and how we drive value while we're also increasing access to the care that people need and want. I will move to St Stella. You haven't had a chance to talk yet. I know you've had two cups of coffee, so you're raring to go here. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so, uh, so, so two comments. Um, when um, your original question, when you talked about um, what, what looks different? What are we doing? Um, how are we responding? Um, there's a couple of things. Um, so, so for us, um, as a community um, clinic, um, over 70% of our staff are from the community. Um, our, um, our board, our community board is 51% um, uh, are patients of our health center. So we're pretty grounded, we believe in, um, in the community. Um, and we do a number of um, listening sessions with our patients and with our community to find out um, how things are going. But one of the things that we did um, in response to this, um, I would say this ongoing kind of seems like um, uh, issue uh, or traumatic uh, uh, events on top of each other is that we started paying attention to our staff um, from the, the point that, again, um, our staff from the community, um, predominantly people of color, they were feeling the same that was happening in the community. Um, they were, um, had emotions. Um, and so one of the things that, that we did um, in the uh, wake of the uh, death of uh, George Floyd is that um, we had our own protest demonstration. Um, we, had, uh, we had staff that we told them that they could make signs, they could um, whatever expression that they wanted to have. And what we did um, uh, in the middle of the day, um, we, um, we had a couple of staff who were African drummers. And so uh, we did a, a march around the neighborhood and people had their signs um, that, to express their feelings. And what we found was that uh, the community responded People were honking their horns, um, yelling out the window, um, giving us that encouragement, and the staff really uh, internalized it and um, felt energized and felt like that they had an opportunity to speak their truth uh, because I'm a firm believer that um, if you don't take care of your frontline staff, if they are not um, healthy, if they do not have what they need, it is very difficult for them to provide the care. 
uh, to the patients or to the community. So this was kind of a, uh, something that happened as a spur of the moment. It came up as a, as a idea because uh, we started doing these daily huddles as well, 30 minutes. And the huddles are different than typical clinical huddles. What it was more about was um, we did a mindful moment. So all of us together, we're learning how to uh, meditate, how to focus. Uh, we always had basic uh, up-to-date information on what was going on with, with COVID. Uh, but more importantly, what we started to see, because there was a number of staff who were working from home and what have you, people were using this opportunity to come together as a team. And through, um, through Teams and Zoom, the chat feature, People were, you know, communicating with each other. They were commenting on um, the presentation and it became this healthy start of the day, getting people on the same page, feeling like a team, being able to focus and able to do that in 30 minutes. Uh, so we're, it was something that um, we started and we said, you know what, we're going to continue this. This is going to be a new normal for us. I know you said the first time when they were telling you how to breathe, you kind of thought, what is this? <laughs> but now <laughs> you've seen the richness uh, in it. Yeah. So Dawn, I don't think you've been commenting on things, but I don't know if you had a chance to share what you might be seeing or hearing besides what you've shared. Um, yes, sure. Thank you. Although I, I'm reluctant to follow Stella and that on the ground perspective with, uh, you know, policy wonk speak, um, but I'll try to tie it back. Um, you know, I think from my perspective, um, these twin crises that we're talking about today were playing out in the context of pretty massive transformation that is happening in the U.S. healthcare system right now in general with the move to value-based uh, payment. And, you know, I think part of the reason that's particularly important is because there are really two things that you need for value-based care to be successful. You need data and you need flexibility. Um, so when we're realigning those incentives, we're saying to providers, okay, we're asking you to take accountability for outcomes, you know, whether that's 30 day readmissions or controlling diabetes in your patients, but in exchange, we're going to give you flexibility to deliver care in a more patient centered uh, way. And so what we've seen is that when we're um, offering that uh, providers are responding. Um, they now want to know things like, you know, when your patients are admitted to the hospital, what their social circumstances are going to be when they go back home so that they can reduce uh, readmission risk, um, you know, tracking internal quality metrics, using more telehealth, leveraging a care team. And so then you know, zooming back to April when uncertainty is everywhere, what we saw was that uh, those providers that had already um, been making these investments in transforming care um, were better poised to be uh, nimble and respond to this changing dynamic, ramp up their telehealth, engage care teams, um, track patients across settings, all those things that you really needed to be able to do to deliver effective care. Um, and then what we saw in this particular case, you know, we talk a lot about um, financial risk in value-based payment. We talk about full risk and partial risk and upside risk and downside risk. But the real risk here was the risk of being in fee for service because you are being paid for volume and that volume was drying up. But in a world where you're being paid for outcomes, those outcomes are, are sort of still happening or not happening. Patients are still managing their diabetes or not um, in the context of COVID. And so it just realigned totally, um, you know, the ability of folks to focus on some of those larger issues, um, you know, still a tremendous number of challenges. But I think um, what we're seeing out of that is that, um, you know, rather than sort of setting the move to value-based payment back, this really accelerated that transformation. Um, and then to maybe provide one specific example of, you know, as we kind of build a new normal, um, you know, 
the kinds of things that that we need to be thinking about. One area that we've been very focused on at HHS is around maternal morbidity and mortality in general, racial disparities in maternal morbidity and mortality in particular. And then there have been a whole set of issues uh, related to um, uh, pregnancy care that have emerged during um, COVID. Uh, you know, historically, there are big racial disparities in almost every element of uh, care, including receipt of prenatal care and postpartum follow up. And in an ideal world, telehealth could really offer some hope on that front because it can actually make it, it easier for women to connect to providers, you know, when and where they need them. Um, it can reduce barriers around transportation or, you know, having to miss work or school. Um, and you can't necessarily do everything that you need to do in a, in a um, in-person prenatal or postpartum visit via telehealth. But as one example, ACOG recently issued a recommendation around, you know, really focusing on um, postpartum care as kind of a continuum. And it's not a, just about, does the person come to a six week visit or not? It's about, are we actually engaging, monitoring, all of that. Um, so there's a tremendous opportunity to actually use telehealth to get services to the women who need them most. On the flip side, we know and are seeing some barriers to access telehealth. Do you have a safe environment? Do you have the technology? Do you have the internet access? And so um, I think that's just one really specific example drilling down of where, um, you know, there's an opportunity to leverage this moment to try to do better than we have historically and do things in a way that really is more patient centered and accessible. But there's also a risk that we could, you know, perpetuate or exacerbate disparities if we don't get it right. Yeah, can I can I just say I, I love that Dawn has brought this up. I think that's that is exactly right. I mean, I think that is one of these um, opportunities born of crisis and, and the the push pushing us all into yeah, you could actually do telehealth. <laughs> I think was one of those real bright spots, and I think that it's pushed us you know across the systems that that we have in our, our city really in a really good way to say that we can do it and, and to think of the many ways we can, we can do this. I think the issues in our most vulnerable populations in um, is is about technology, but it is also related to things around language and literacy and what does it mean to to have a visit to do med rec um, over uh, with someone who really doesn't have a Zoom and you're really trying to talk through a an analog phone and to to understand what that means. There are people who are who are studying and helping to develop this, and we have several of them on on our campus who are really interested in in digital and technology solutions for um, low literate and, and poor populations. But the issues that you're talking about are technical and they are about how do you, how, how do we deliver care um, when many of the aspects of this are the barriers to technology, but also to other things about how we communicate are going to really potentially be more exacerbated. And I, this doesn't mean to throw the baby out with the bathwater and to, to resume to everybody has to come in person because that those pose additional challenges. But I think we have to recognize it, um, especially since we're going to likely be in the state for, for a long period and that telehealth will likely be here to stay and recognizing that it is an opportunity and one where we have to address the equity issues constantly. Yeah, and maybe a comment here from Blue Cross in North Carolina as well, and just some numbers behind us. We saw a um, 7,000% increase in telehealth, 7,000. 7, so, albeit from my lowest baseline, it was sort of remarkable. And it, it is, for Don's and Kristen's point, um, both an opportunity and a risk to sort of really think this through and make sure you get this right. For, for instance, if you're an essential worker, getting a day off, paying extra for parking, right? Those things are, are, are barriers that are hard to, to, to overcome. Um, so telehealth provides a great solution. But that being said, um, sort of some of the, if you don't do it right, then you can actually exacerbate the, the sort of the, the, the disparities that you see. Again, the technology and access to technology language are, are, are in that bucket of, uh, of challenges that might result. You know, uh, a specific place where we've seen some great opportunities for telehealth is behavioral health specifically. And that's a specific area where, as you think about the modality of practice, um, those conversations and that therapeutic relationship for cognitive behavioral therapy and other things 
actually works pretty well. <laughs> so, and there's pretty decent evidence that says that cognitive behavioral therapy, when you use a video sort of conference, uh, a telehealth technology includes video, is just pretty comparable to outcomes that you might see um, in an in-person in setting. One of the challenges, however, I've, I've been talking to some of my psychiatry friends is that um, they'll frequently have these appointments. And, and then um, this is somewhat specific to COVID, but you, you'll catch people in their home and they're dealing with their kids in the background, right? So it's actually hard to create that therapeutic environment where you're really engaged in that, in that, in that relationship or, or they'll, they'll call a patient and that patient is shopping in the grocery store because it needed to get done at that time because of all the things going on in their life. Uh, and, and so, so towards the points that were made earlier by both Don and Kristen, real huge opportunity, we should go for it, but we should also sort of uh, mitigate sort of some of the optimism by, and putting the right checks and balances in place to make sure we get it right and ensure that there is quality that is um, established and that we are able to send this, the same high quality care that you would expect from an in-person visit. Now there's a question that's come in uh, that kind of relates to this, that as we create this new normal, how do we make certain until we have universal coverage, how do we make certain we don't create something that uh, creates more barriers for people who don't have insurance? So how, how are you thinking about the uninsured or underinsured at this time to make certain that they are getting services or they're getting the care they need while we create a system that's uh, universal access for all. So what, what are people doing? We heard one from Philip. Maybe you have more, Philip, about what Rush was doing to reach out to people uh, that were vulnerable and uh, needed equitable care in their area. Other examples? Well, I'll, I'll give you an example. So as a, a FQHC, um, we provide care to uh, people regardless of their ability to pay or whether they're insured or not, that's part of the FQHC model. Um, and we receive um, grant funds um, through, um, through HRSA to do that. But one of the things that, um, that we found that, um, that really works is that um, you have um, eligibility support workers who are available because most of the time people are not even aware if, uh, that they qualify for some type of insurance. And let's, let's be real, um, the insurance industry, that whole thing, it is complex. And so oftentimes we find that even those who um, have insurance that are on Medicaid, then the, um, the, uh, they, they lose their eligibility because they didn't respond in a timely manner, that kind of thing. So when you have uh, those access points at the point of care, where people can, and it is one of the things that we do, uh, someone um, says that they are uh, uninsured, we have them meet uh, with the financial case aid, or we have them meet uh, with the eligibility support worker, um, and to find out if they are eligible uh, for any type of insurance. And one of the things that we point out to them is that um, this is important, not just for your visit here, but it's important um, that you have the ability to seek health care anywhere within the system. And so making sure uh, that you have access uh, to that um, is, is huge. Um, going back to, to telehealth, uh, we too have found that is a very, very um, useful tool, one that um, we had to, we were um, working, trying to get there. And then when COVID-19 hit, it was kind of like, you know, everybody had to learn and we had to get it uh, right. And we did find that particularly in our behavior health that um, the patients really, really liked it. But one of the things that we did realize that again, um, not everybody has um, the connectivity, the, uh, the technology. So we came across the idea, um, somebody else, came across the idea and then we just said, hey, we're gonna duplicate that. And that is to create these, um, what we call hubs within the community. Um, Hennepin County has a series of network of libraries of different kinds of community places where we would establish uh, private offices where people could go in 
the computer, the technology is set up. We use community health workers who would be there uh, and it would be based on an appointment, but there would be a place where that they could go in and they could have a telehealth visit with their provider and you're not have to worry about, uh, do you have the connectivity? We also found that many of our um, patients, even though they had cell phones, those cell phones <laughs> maybe had so many minutes and we were hearing from um, our patients like, you know, I know that this is a 30, 45 minute uh, session, but guess what? I don't have that much time on my uh, mobile phone. Mm -hmm. So this was something that we felt was a necessity in order to create that uh, access. Stella, I love, I love that example, uh, you know, and it, and it reinforces something that you know, we say all the time is just because you have an insurance card in your pocket doesn't mean you actually have access to healthcare, right? And so those, those, those patients that you saw in those hubs, they might have been insured, but had you not set up a place where they could go, they still weren't accessing or utilizing care. So, you know, insurance isn't the silver bullet, but I will give one kind of personal anecdote uh, about insurance. So I was at my in-laws place uh, two or three weeks ago. My father-in-law said, well, you know, Philip, I, I haven't really been a, a big proponent of universal health care, not because I don't think it's a good idea, but because I just never thought we had enough money. It would just be too expensive to do it. Uh, and so I, one of the things that I've learned, Philip, is that when the U.S. government needs a trillion dollars, we can snap our fingers and come up with a trillion dollars. So maybe it's not that universal health coverage is too expensive. Maybe it's just we've made certain choices. So I think, you know, if there's one thing that we've learned in high relief, in, a, in addition to the injustice and the inequities, it's the art of what's possible, right? It is possible to make different choices when a crisis hits. So how do we maintain that momentum, uh, keep that veil lifted, and really think about, you know, maybe the new normal is a new set of possibilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that resonates with me as well. And I, I, I do think that is the opportunity of this time um, to, to speak to the, the question that you originally asked about, about um, you know, and what Philip just underscored that having an insurance card in your pocket or knowing something is free is not necessarily the same as actually uh, having true access. It's one of the reasons we've been, um, we from very pretty early on in the pandemic really took um, uh, a lot of our testing uh, directly into the community as opposed to waiting for people. So in our context, um, um, our um, Latino community makes up about 15% of the population in San Francisco, well over 50% of the cases. Um, and um, what we learned by partnering with community organizations, by setting up um, neighborhood-based testing sites um, uh, with our community partners was just so much more about the, the actual true barriers. So there were issues of um, misinformation about whether one would have to pay for this, um, understanding whether how one could be connected to care if one were positive, concerns that if you got tested, you would not be able to show up at your job, and so concerned about job security, concerns about public charge, that if you access testing for COVID, that somehow this was going to um, harm your immigration status. Um, and all of those things were things that we only learned and could actually have overcome by really partnering with the community organizations and taking things to where people are. And part of that was not just testing, but actually then partnering with the community-based organizations who did all of the follow-up, um, providing uh, food and other types of information to people who had tested positive, connecting them with other types of public health services related to if they weren't able to isolate or quarantine where they were. And I think, um, I think uh, the, the, the groups that have been doing this well in our organization did it early. And I think what they learned also helped to inform the public health response, as well as uh, the individual health systems response, because we understood so much more about the barriers and it helped us to act in concert to be able to, to overcome those, to do just at a very base level, how, how do you get tested if you're concerned about COVID? That's uh, great, Kirsten. You just answered one of the questions that's come in through the q and is how, how do we help citizens who are overwhelmed with all of this misinformation and knowing exactly what they need to do to prevent illness, you're getting out and partnering with the community was one way to try to uh, uh, address that uh, issue there. And let me just, can I just say, just to say one more thing on that point is that I, I think 
we we have we had to be concerned about misinformation early in the pandemic and as this goes longer particularly in our more marginalized communities the the rate of misinformation only continues to compound itself and this is not something that we can let our guard down on we we really have to continue these partnerships and continue to to reinforce those because i think for communities that really are feeling both the the double wh- the triple whammy of um of uh, COVID, of the racial injustice, and of uh, the economic uh, worsening in our economies, I think you're you those uh, feed on themselves, and uh, I think there's further marginalization that only feeds the misinformation. So, you know, and it brings to mind another maybe opportunity for healthcare because I think something else that's been thrust into high relief is this: the near universal not understanding of science, right? How, how science is made, what a result is or isn't, how it's communicated. So, you know, I, I wonder what is the role of a trusted healthcare provider who are often really some of the most trusted people in a local community. It's not that healthcare as a field is trusted, it's that a person's provider is trusted. So what's the opportunity for a provider to really offer some, you know, science making 101, right? To help in times of non-crisis, kind of raise our understanding as Americans of what science is, what it can tell us and not tell us, uh, and maybe combat misinformation, uh, unfortunately, when the next crisis hits. Mm -hmm. And just to give a very specific example of something that we did in North Carolina, and I have to give credit to Dr. Tindesitinda, our new CEO. When he he came to Blue Cross this summer, he was very concerned about COVID. We were in the midst of the upswing um, in June, and it was quite frightening in terms of just looking at the numbers both locally as well as nationally. <clears throat> when he came in, he was very interested in, and very concerned about the misinformation that was sort of out and about. <clears throat> and we really wanted to focus on messages that were that everybody could agree on. And as a and it's interesting, as Blue Cross, we're both this organization that sits in the healthcare space um, where we're working with hospitals and we're part of the, the larger hospital or healthcare industrial complex, you might call it. <clears throat> Simultaneously, we're actually one of the largest businesses in North Carolina. Mm-hmm. So we are a member of the Business Roundtable, right, and, 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 a, and a large one at that. And, and how do you use that position to sort of bridge the gap? And many hospital systems are as well. Atrium and in, 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 is one example um, in North Carolina that did this. And, and so what we decided, or what Tim did decided, was he would start working with our, our collaborators and build a coalition of the willing to really get out there and work with other healthcare providers to really think about what the opportunities were to educate. And it wasn't our message. We felt it was really critical to echo and reinforce the message coming out from the Department of Health. <clears throat> the wait six feet apart, the wear a mask, the wash your hands. Really simple, simple messaging. And it turns out we have a communications department that does this all day and this is their job. And using that and leveraging our internal strengths again in a partnership with the other business uh, individuals in the business community was an opportunity to drive this message home. And there's a fundamental belief that the best way to get businesses open was to really stop the spread of the virus. And so this messaging had this real opportunity, both in terms of strengthening the, the, the healthcare message for that audience and that membership in that group, while simultaneously working with our, our business audiences as well and bridging that divide and bridging that gap to really put out trusted information that was coming out from the Department of Health. And that partnership, private, uh, the public-private partnership provided a real opportunity to move the needle forward. Yeah, I want to underscore what both Philip and, and Vaughn are saying. I, I do think that there is a role for healthcare is um, healthcare uh, providers are oftentimes the, the trusted uh, people, individual providers in the community. And I really would love to highlight a, a lot of the work that individual uh, uh, doctors and nurses in our system have done with um, with doing local media and being on Facebook Live and on working, uh, really getting the community-based organizations and going to do talks and, and information sessions there in the languages, right? So in, in Spanish, in, in Cantonese, and in Vietnamese, in particular in our communities. Um, I, I think that I think that those those things have the 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 ongoing um, uh, requests for those really underscores um, how how hungry that the hunger for for information from trusted sources. And then I I think the issue of um, of healthcare organizations as um, as uh, members of the community, I, I think is also an important one. And before this started, we 
Um, we had made a commitment at our institution to be part of uh, to be an anchor institution and to realign our our um, the way we do purchasing, the way we do hiring, to uh, to really um, uh, be a, an economic player within the community, and that is as important to health as the types of healthcare we provide. Um, and I think um, I think that is where many of us are looking to to see the organization sort of in in the longer term um, to also make the types of investments that are going to be important. And I think that. But um, I think that that we've laid the groundwork well because of the partnerships with public health, with healthcare, with the other sectors have, have really, I think, helped people to see what might be possible. And that's what makes me optimistic that we can continue to push forward in this area. Let me take us uh, in a little different direction with uh, a question that I think is pointed at dawn, but I think it uh, bears consideration across all payers and, and how providers would think about it. So here's the question. Has Medicare policy team considered paying for outcomes and disparity reduction? The comment is reimbursement and funding will drive change and better outcomes more quickly than many other methods. So Dawn, has Medicare policy team considered paying for outcomes and disparity reduction? Uh, the short answer is yes, we have considered that we are looking at this. Uh, it's a huge focus area. There is a ton of questions about exactly what that looks like. Um, so uh, I would note, I can try to circulate it after this, there is an, uh, an NQF technical expert panel coming up on uh, risk adjustment that includes an emphasis on social risk. Um, but so whenever we're thinking about, um, you know, these kinds of questions there, the, the issue is, um, you know, what outcomes are we talking about? How are we going to measure disparities? And then what's the right way to make sure that we are um, rewarding outcomes and not creating perverse incentives. Um, so we want to um, make sure that we're incentivizing closing the gaps um, and providing high quality care to everyone, particularly to those who need it most. Um, we don't want to be in a situation where we are potentially um, penalizing safety net uh, providers, but we also don't want to convey the message that um, it's okay to have a lower bar for care or a lower um, threshold for what high quality care looks like in different populations. And so there's constantly this question about, you know, what does it look like to thread that needle? And then how do we get the data that would help us um, inform these kinds of decisions? I was interested in what Kirsten was saying earlier about, I think you mentioned use of race ethnicity data within your own, you know, within the UCSF system. Um, you know, in many ways we rely on data that comes in from Medicare enrollment files. There are issues around uh, the um, reliability of that data. There have been, we are, we are currently looking at uh, other ways to collect social risk information. We do have some work at CMMI that has used things like um, area deprivation index, which the state of Maryland has used somewhat in the Maryland total cost of care model. Um, so, you know, we're constantly thinking about, okay, you know, where do we get the data? What's the right data to use? And then what would it look like to try to pay for outcomes um, in a way that is appropriately adjusted and or pay for gap closure? Um, you know, this is an area that I think COVID has certainly shined a, a light on um, because of the disparities in COVID um, uh, and the administrator has been, you know, quite uh, vocal about, uh, about the importance of those disparities, about the high burden that we've seen in the dual eligible population and the um, population with uh, end stage renal disease, which are two really vulnerable groups from a, a sort of Medicare perspective. Um, and then we're also trying to think about, um, you know, the kind of quality measurement and data standardization 
uh, pieces of this um, in our accountable health communities model. We are collecting data on things like housing instability and food insecurity at large scale. And we know that those are things that more and more providers are collecting. Um, but there, there's a lot of questions and I would love to hear from Philip in particular, but anyone here about this um, you know, set of issues. Um, one of the things I think we struggle with are which of these things are the outcomes we should be oriented around and which are the processes we should be enabling. So as one example, and I'm not saying that this is the right answer, but we might think about um, you know, disparities in outcomes, whether that's by dual eligible status or racial and ethnic group as a thing that we want to close and the tools, the ways that you get there might be addressing things like food insecurity um, or barriers in access to care. Um, but in some ways um, we're still better at measuring all those process things than we are <laughs> measuring the outcomes, but we don't wanna to get too prescriptive about the processes. So that's a bit of the, um, uh, the, challenge that we are are thinking through right now and I think you know we are also looking to the rapidly evolving literature in all of these areas we're just getting more and more information both about um you know what works and how to measure it so so full disclosure and before I even dive in Sunny anyone cut off my mic at like 90 seconds because I could easily fall down a rabbit hole on this topic so <laughs> You just, you know, get the shepherd's hook and pull me off. But I've been so uh, excited for this rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> well, so full disclosure, so I am the co-chair of the National Quality Forum's Disparity Standing Committee. Uh, the committee has been overseeing a trial period of social risk adjustment for the past three or four years. And we're actually set to start our work on Friday and kind of wrapping it up. And then there will be another expert panel kind of reconvened, I think, given some of the new literature and the new uncovering of some of these issues. Um, just a, a couple of things, and then really, Don, you and I will dive into a rabbit hole together offline sometime. Uh, so, you know, in terms of the, the fear of using social risk adjustment uh, and that having that mask inequity or allow a lower standard of care, well, let's just stratify by whatever social risk variable that we are adjusting for, and we could actually highlight any inequity. So I'm not so concerned about that argument. I think that the bigger problem is the social risk data we have are just not capable of doing this in a valid way, right? So you can either adjust for black race versus everybody else, and black race is not a risk factor, right? There's no intervention for black race. It's not even a real thing, right? Racism is the risk factor. So the other one is dual eligibility, which yes, there's a lot of evidence that shows that dual eligible patients receive poor quality of care, so maybe that's a valid adjuster and a valid proxy, but it's also related to every other social risk factor in the community. So the social determinants of health and also those individual social risks that a patient comes with into the, the waiting area or the, the clinical encounter. So what we really need to do this well, I think, uh, and maybe this is the new opportunity and maybe a new, new, new normal in the future is a national kind of standardized social risk data collection system that has a strategy and a plan and that allows all of our sectors to avail ourselves of that information. So it allows a clinician to provide better care. It allows public health departments to craft better interventions. It allows CMS to make smarter adjustments based on the mechanisms of injustice that create inequities in healthcare outcomes like readmission, right? Dual eligibility, what's the intervention for dual eligibility short of getting rid of Medicare and Medicaid? Right? And not all dual eligible patients are the same. Right? So the suite of interventions for a dual eligible patient in Wyoming is going to be very different than in the South Bronx. And so it's not particularly informative as an adjuster. So I think keeping what I am going to counsel NQF kind of going forward, this is Philip's hat only, is that we just stop settling for what's currently feasible and really set our gaze on where we want to go and so maybe what's currently feasible is step one on a 20 step plan, but let's enumerate the 20 steps to get us a data collection system that will help all of our sectors do this work and help patients and communities. So I'm gonna pull myself out of the hole uh, and mute. So thank you. So if you wanna, can I just jump in real quick on this? Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> <Because Don't go down laughs> I'm gonna put my vote quickly on, um, on the metrics still are a good idea. We should try. We should try to do this. Like if I can say the thing that probably drove 
why we set up a health equity council is because all of a sudden we were being incentivized on not just reaching our hypertension target, but closing the gap through our prime metric, right? That was the thing that all of a sudden got both of our health systems to say, well, what do we know about how to do this? What should we do? So there is a way healthcare is very used to the metrics. They're very used to the economic incentives. That is the thing that actually drives real action. Um, And it is the thing that said, we have to collect better data and we have to do self-report and we have to figure out how to get frontline staff to talk with patients to say why we need this data, why, what what does that mean to do? So it is not easy, but it is also, it it was never more clear to me why metrics actually drive the types of of real um, discussions uh, because that is how healthcare is still incentivized, whether we like it or not. And um, and then once we got all the data, it was all of a sudden really complicated. It's really complicated, all the stuff that you're talking about, but it is it is still important, I think, that we try. And one last tiny point, it's a huge point, but a short one. So tracking the gaps is not the same as measuring equity and health equity. So I think, you know, the lower hanging fruit are just tracking trends and inequities or gaps over time. What does it really mean to have a metric that captures whether a patient of any background really feels that he or she has the same equitable opportunity for top-notch health care as a white, cisgendered, heterosexual, Judeo-Christian rich man, right? That's a measure of health equity that I'd love to see, uh, but we're still far away from that kind of patient-engaged metric, I think. So if, 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 okay, if, if I can just add, so one of the things that um, I feel really fortunate about is that we are, this partnership with Hennepin County, so Hennepin County is one of the counties that declared racism as a public health crisis, mm. correct? And more importantly, because oftentimes, um, uh, as I uh, challenge people, we, we get caught up in data We admire the data, we, you know, and we look at different ways, but we never really get to, you know, the effective interventions. What is the data actually telling us? And in healthcare, we have been trained to treat symptoms, but not get at the root cause. And when we declare racism as a public health crisis, then we're starting to get at that root cause. When you have a major a uh, governmental entity like a large county government who is involved in housing, who is involved in education, uh, who is involved, who is a major employer, who's a $2 billion entity, then you really have some tools where you can actually have some significant interventions. So not only did the um, county declare Um, that racism was a public health crisis, but then they put metrics, goals behind. How are you then going to Hennepin County uh, change your your practice? How are you going to then start looking at your contracts, your vendors? Are in fact, are you contributing to the problem? Are you continually to provide um, the same contracts to the same old uh, vendors who are predominantly you know, white, or are you really stepping outside of the box and are you really challenging yourself to make sure that you are providing opportunities because of the importance of the economics? I heard, I think it was Kirsten or someone that said that, and it is extremely important that when you look at those social determinants of health, that that is real. And so that for a healthcare provider or for a county government to be looking at um, are my uh, residents and citizens, do they have access to good jobs? Do they have access to good um, benefits? Do they have access to um, uh, housing that is safe and affordable? All of those things lead to making sure that there is equity within um, your population. So, uh, but getting at that root cause, understanding how racism, understanding the historical uh, uh, parts of racism that the county actually played or that government played in locking people out, redlining, covenants, and being able to acknowledge that and then moving on to make real change. Thank you, Stella. So another question from the audience uh, reflects, Stella, on what you said 
about that community health centers have a legal requirement to have at least majority board membership of patients. Ought this to become a requirement for other members of clinical care mm. organizations that like those represented on the call? So what do people think about that? So maybe tell us how that works for you and then maybe others can respond. Like, I mean, I'm sure you see good things about it and things that you kind of go, oh, this has been a little more challenging. <laughs> uh, so maybe maybe reflect on that and then the others can, can uh, respond. Well, I, um, and, and again, that, that board of majority patients are my bosses, right? So they, so um, I can only see um, good things, right? So because um, when the patients are also the, um, the governing board, you are able to see, not, not only do they bring that perspective to the table, but they also have the tools to make the changes. That's huge. So we're not trying to guess whether or not this is going on or, or what are some of the um, uh, issues or drawbacks. Our board that meets on a monthly basis brings that to the table mm -hmm. and to the staff, to me, and we can then um, act on it right away. It also gives us um, that opportunity as well as that um, the board members who are patients who live in the community, they are also messengers. They're also those trusted uh, sources um, in the community. So it's, it's a real benefit for us. Now, I think some of the other organizations that are at the table, they may not can achieve that 51% um, but I think it would be a missed opportunity if you did not have some way of bringing your um, constituents, your um, community, your patients into your organization in a very meaningful uh, way. Comments, reflections. Yeah, I'll say there are organizations, I think of Mass General Hospital that has kind of four boards. There's a one for research, for education, for clinical care, and then also for community, where they've given that the same prominence. And, you know, being at the AAMC, I'm certainly not going to advocate for more requirements for our member hospitals. But I think the point of how do you bring in community voice, perspective, expertise in a real meaningful bi-directional way that recognizes that expertise paired with healthcare expertise is where the magic happens. Uh, and so I think there's still a lot of perfunctory engagement that's really more, here's a bunch of our ideas. We're gonna ask 10 people from the community who are, might be self-appointed community leaders who might not necessarily reflect the community anymore either. Uh, you know, for a sign off or a checkbox, I think there's some of that still, but I definitely feel momentum and have seen shifts for large academic health centers to really begin to incorporate patient and community voice in ways that do share power and lead to real change. And I think that is absolutely kind of the four direction. When I think about multi-sector collaborations, uh, they're all patient and community centered with, with that wisdom at the core. So I, I, I love that. Yeah, I, 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 also, I, I also love I, I love the I the I love the concept. I love the community health center model. Um, I think I think um, operationalizing it um, is is the challenge uh, for for larger health systems. I, I do feel encouraged that um, so in our organization we launched a patient community advisory board um, related to COVID, um, and it was driven. Uh, it, it's driven uh, mostly in response to. The, the many, many research studies, we're an academic institution that we have going on, <clears throat> as, but as well as, um, as, well as a, a formal uh, forum for uh, community, um, community input on, on a lot of our community testing projects, for example. So I, and I do, there has been real power in that. And I think it's, um, I think it has that bi-directional effect that, that you, you are talking about, Stella. I, I think it, I think that the learning is going both ways and the communications out is going both ways because we have that chance in a very intentional way to think about how do we do this um, right around COVID. It doesn't function though, as you know, there are bosses, right? And so, and I think that that, that gap in power, the gap, the hierarchy 
Um, the understanding, you know, just as Philip is saying, you know, when you have 10 people, are, are they representing the voices of the community in a diversity like San Francisco? That's hard to do. Um, and, and so I, I think there are challenges, but I, 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 I don't know. I, I would like us to continue to move more in this direction to try for more venues where, where there's active dialogue and partnership um, in a way that, that organizations are held accountable. And I'll just note, uh, you know, a number of the innovation center models at CMS include some requirements around either a kind of a patient advisory board or patient participation and some sort of advisory group. So that takes us in this direction, if not to the kind of patient ownership that the community health center model includes. I think there's one other opportunity here, and let me be clear, I'm speaking here as uh, Don Alley, roundtable member, not Don <laughs> Alley, um, CMS um, uh, representative, but, um, you know, there's an effort that is also out for public comment right now out of Hopkins and somewhere else that I'm going to leave out around thinking about, um, you know, community health of the community surrounding the hospital as an indicator of hospital quality, and I think mm -hmm. um, sort of separate and apart, but related from the question of um, engaging uh, patients directly um, and listening to them me meaningfully is this issue of like what we all want to get to is sustain, excuse me, sustained impact and improved outcomes. And I think, you know, there is this question of like, how many times do we have to learn that we are more likely to get there if we involve the people who we're trying to impact than if we just design it ourselves. Um, so, you know, I think as we have more um, compelling evidence around how you do that well and, and the where that impact will come, we can also see some increased uptake uh, there. You know, one comment on the questions that are coming in is uh, that uh, there's a recent announcement by large business to increase the diversity of their boards. And then they've seen a lot of progress when they have done that. And is that a really something that healthcare needs to take home to heart? to look at uh, your boards and look at the diversity there and uh, to represent who you're serving as well as uh, the, re the community that you're serving. And uh, Dawn, I really like that concept of there'd be a measure. Did you say that's out for comment now that one of the measures would be of an organization, what's the health of your community, your geographic community? Did I hear that right? So I should say it's not out for comment by, yeah, Philip, do you want to jump in? Okay, yeah. so it's, it's actually, it's a, in service of IBM Watson Health's hospital rankings. They've asked Johns Hopkins to develop a metric that could, that attempts to um, capture a hospital's contribution to community health and equity. It's not really health equity, it's more kind of institutional culture, climate, pay equity, gender equity, et cetera. Um, it, the comment period is still open. Uh, it closes on Friday. Um, if you go to aamc.org slash charge, uh, C-H-A-R-G-E, you can see a webinar with Drs. Josh, Josh Sharfstein and Rachel Thornton explaining the metric, um, going through the domains. So if you want a kind of a quick primer on what you might respond to. You know, the Loan Institute, L-O-W-N, also has a new metric that tries to capture some of the civic responsibility of healthcare organizations. You know, there are formal community benefit forms that capture some of the, the, the free care, some community health improvement activity. It's more about pay. So there are different, there are different models out there on how you can quantify um, a hospital's contribution. I think a challenge is coming up with a national metric when you know, the spirit of community health improvement is responding to locally identified needs. Right, and so how can you have two or three things that all hospitals get points for, but if your community says, no, we care about these other two or three things, then all of a sudden you rank low in your community contribution, even though your match is perfect. So again, it all comes back to data. We need a large scale national data system that could help us perform all of these different functions in really valid kind of locally specific and, and nuanced ways. But I think uh, what we've heard from our discussion so far is that if you cannot show concrete ways that you are listening to your community and you are involving your community in your work and you see it reflected, 
on your boards, then you're probably not giving the service to this that you really should be. Uh, and I think that's something to really push us in organizations, in our organizations in healthcare, uh, to really look all the way up to the top, as well as like, who, who are we buying our produce from, <laughs> you know, and what are our employees doing and what kind of benefits and what does that look like and what does housing look like surrounding our organization. Um, so there's a, a lot of, as someone said on the uh, uh, question here, we need to push ourselves. We need to push ourselves to go beyond what we are doing now. It's not enough. It's not enough. Um, so one last uh, uh, question here uh, is, uh, I think we've addressed it in some way, but I think it's such an important topic, it's probably worth mentioning again, mental health, the awareness and the mental health of what the pandemic is doing. I think Stella spoke eloquently to how she's paying attention to the caregivers to, to make certain they're being cared for so then they can flow care out to others. Uh, any other thoughts around what we're doing to make certain people are getting the mental health care and service and environment that they need during this pandemic? Other thoughts? Well, I'll, I'll, oh, go ahead, Vaughn. Yes, yeah, so what I might say is we've been at Blue Cross, we've been looking at this in a couple of ways. Um, one is actually probably three ways. So one is actually in our own community, in our own employees, and similar to what Stella mentioned before. Um, we have about 4,000, 5,000 employees at Blue Cross. And um, fortunately for us, we're, we're pretty fortunate in the sense that we are actually able to send many of them to work from home. And so we're able to keep them safe that way. But there's a small cohort of essential workers that still have to be in the office. And really thinking about what are the services for those populations to, to sort of manage the, um, the, the, the behavioral health challenges that some of these uh, our employees are having has been critically important in supporting them in different ways. So making out, creating outreach, creating opportunities for them to gather, even if it isn't physically gathering together, to have conversations, opening up lots of lines of communication. So internally at Blue Cross, we're making sure we look inward because it's, it's important for us to, to think about the, um, the, uh, the individuals we serve. As, as we talk about the, um, as we talk about sort of the membership of North Carolina in terms of those individuals, we talk broadly about uh, behavioral health and the broad telehealth policy and the increased access that we've seen, which is wonderful. Um, and so giving uh, access to those members has been really critical to us in terms of making it as easy as possible for individuals to seek care or to seek behavioral health care and lots of different behavioral health care, whether it be substance use disorder, on the extreme end or serious mental illness to sort of a depression on sort of the, um, that, uh, that might actually be secondary to COVID is actually critically important as well. So thinking about the broad spectrum uh, and the range of uh, behavioral health disorders. The last piece I would say is that in terms of how we think about it, as we think about sort of how we might work in the community, not just our members, but one of the places where we've been sort of focused is we didn't really begin to think about social isolation and sort of the opportunities in that space, um, uh, not specifically for our membership, but more broadly across the community in which we live, because this is a time when, um, for all the reasons that I'm sure everybody is acutely aware of, um, isolation increases, and then for certain populations, it increases risk of other diseases, the inability to manage their physical health as well. So we've been working through our foundation, through our community giving arm, to really begin to study as well as to think about opportunities to sort of um, invest in places where this might be an opportunity to improve outcomes in that space. Stella, you have the last uh, a comment <laughs> here before we go to summary. Oh, the pressure. So um, uh, uh, two things. So we, we also um, have a number of school-based clinics. And um, uh, in March, when the um, uh, governor declared the, um, uh, the emergency in the schools, um, were closed. Um, our uh, providers, particularly our uh, mental health providers, um, through telehealth, were able to stay connected with those students. Uh, and it was so critical um, because as we have seen, uh, you talk about the data that the increase in um, suicide, um, particularly mm -hmm. among young people. And so being able to have that connection with them to, um, and that they were already um, 
connected with a trusted resource. This was their uh, school-based um, therapist or counselor. And so um, our staff were able to maintain those connections all the way through the summer. And now with um, our schools are doing the distance learning. So now already having established that telehealth communication with those students being able to continue to do that. We are also looking at how do you do that with the with the parents, because there's a strong belief that you can't just treat the child in isolation. There is um, the critical need that you have to look at what is going on in the household with the parents and how do you make sure that they have access to those resources as well. I think as we all know that um, uh, mental health, behavior health has been devalued in um, our uh, country, that it has not been paid as much attention to. When we look at uh, what has happened with uh, police brutality, um, oftentimes when, when people are talking about reforming the police departments, they're talking about making sure that uh, the right appropriate professional shows up. And oftentimes they're talking about someone who is in a mental health crisis um, and if you show up and it's the police and they're not equipped, they're not um, informed. And so then it turns into a situation where um, the, uh, the individual who needed help um, ends up getting hurt, getting uh, or murdered. Um, and so how do we uh, make sure that we are able to expand the access to mental health services? Uh, and that's really critical. Well said, Stella. So I'm gonna turn us to the other panelists uh, for any last closing comments. Um, so about 30 seconds each. Dawn, oh, go ahead, Carson. I, I think one of the things that I, I love about the stories that people have told here today has been how much work was happening uh, before the pandemic started. And I think the real opportunity for us who are thinking and actively working in this space is to uh, see the opportunities in the moment to take build on what was happening before and think in sort of an out of the box type of way like Philip is encouraging us to do uh, to, to find those ways in which we respond not just to the crisis but to think about the sustainability beyond this. I do think that the pandemic is an opportunity and many of the much of the work that's being done means that we have the building blocks if we can now think in sustainable ways. So that gives me a lot of hope. Dawn? I also um, feel hopeful. I think we've heard so many great stories here and also, um, and I think this was Philip who said this earlier, um, but seeing that we can change this quickly in a crisis shows what we can accomplish um, when we have to. And the question is how do we make sure that we um, you know, build a new normal that is more effective uh, and equitable. And I think of all the things we've talked about here, um, you know, the thing that feels like the bedrock of that to me is, uh, is data and the ways that we can um, make sure that as we are building new systems or evolving our current systems, we're doing that in a way that allows us to see uh, the gaps, I'm going to steal uh, or or uh, a quote uh, that I heard from my former colleague, Chisera Asmoga, last week. That's a James Baldwin quote that not, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And I think we're facing a lot of things right now, but we need to be able to continue to um, see them. And the language of healthcare is data and incentives and reimbursements. So we have to figure out how to take this conversation and really cement it there. Philip, 30 seconds. I'll even be quicker. I think just to build on, on the comments before, how do we take the data? How do we take these opportunities to position healthcare as a partner in developing a health agenda and not just a healthcare agenda? And that's where I'm most optimistic. All right. Vaughn? Yeah, and I'll be quick here too. I, I agree with Kristen's comment about um, just making sure that this is an opportunistic time we should take advantage of. And Don's idea about 
also making sure that um, we be very deliberate in how we do this so that we don't recreate the mistakes of the past. The only thing I would add is I agree with the data, but I also think it's so critical to involve community. And that it's not always about the data as much as I love the data personally myself, but making sure that we connect and understand the culture that's involved as well. And I would just uh, thank our panelists today. And I would say the other thing we should, uh, as a summary, is that if we're not feeling uncomfortable ourselves inside and our or organizations, if we're not feeling uncomfortable about where we are with racism, health equity, the inequities, the community that we're in and what could be achieved, if we're not feeling uncomfortable about our role, we're probably not digging deep enough. So um, Stella, did you wanna say, I did, didn't give you a final closing, your last, uh, any last comments to us? Well, I, I, the, the one comment that I kept thinking about was about how quickly we moved in the crisis. And I thought about all of my management training. And one of the things that they tell us is that if you wanna get people moving, create a, a crisis. And so I would say that um, we don't have to create a crisis. We have been <laughs> in this crisis for decades, we just kind of got a little bit, I don't know, complacent or numb to the crisis. And that's what we don't want to do. Amen. Thank you all uh, our panelists. They have been a uh, great discussion here. Thank you for the questions that people have submitted. And thank you for joining us for this population health and challenging times. Uh, insights from key domains of healthcare. Thank you leaders and thank you for participants today. Please join us this afternoon for the public health uh, insight uh, virtual workshop. So again, thank you and good day. Thank you everyone.